I uh, would like to talk with you about something that we all experience. It should be a comment to all of us who take care of animals that there are misdoses of heartworm preventives. So the dilemma of the misdose, I'd like to talk with you about uh, preventing that, the importance of it, how to judge whether or not it's important, and then maybe some novel ways in how we might uh, patch up the wrecked ship. So uh, key point number one is, is that good people miss doses. Um, it happens. Uh, I think um, one of our people here today admitted missing some doses. Um, and here's an example of that. This is uh, a, a dog in which at the left side of the screen you can see the blue stars which show purchase of product um, and uh, the negative tests in green as we move from left to right uh, over a period of time from uh, 2008 through 2010. And what you see is, is these people were incredible. Uh, they purchased product uh, most often in uh, 12 uh, dose uh, packets, and um, they came to their veterinarian uh, yearly, uh, or perhaps more often. Um, but in uh, 2009, something happened in July, August, and September, and that's the red line. And then at that time, uh, no product was purchased, and uh, the dog developed heartworms. As you look at the far right, it was diagnosed in late August in 2010. So these people were amazing, probably as well as you could expect a client to be realistically, and yet something happened, and they missed three months, and they picked probably the worst three months that they could pick. So good people miss doses. Why does that happen? Well, uh, one is some good things happen. People go on vacation. Uh, maybe they go on vacation and uh, take their dog to an area that has heartworms and you don't have them. Maybe you live in Scottsdale. Um, but, uh, or you go on vacation, the client goes on vacation and leaves the dog with someone else to take care of it and doses are missed. But oftentimes it's something that's a crisis. So the crisis can be, you know, personal injury. Um, it can be even severe personal injury that ends in uh, death. Um, other things happen. Financial crises occur. This could occur could happen to a family who's now unable to purchase heartworm preventive. If you look at medical records in, in poor areas, you'll find there are clients who come in and buy one pill once a month, uh, and some crisis will certainly throw them into uh, an inability to uh, purchase product. It also can occur if someone loses their job and now they're looking for work and they are uh, distraught about this. Uh, another thing that I've observed is, is that oftentimes uh, family projects can uh, come into way of this, uh, particularly wallpapering as is shown in this photograph, um, and uh, this can cause family strife and people will miss uh, having the house remodeled, for example. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the husband. And the husband is oftentimes to blame, uh, forgets to pick up the medication, leaves it on the dashboard of the car in 110 degrees heat till the medication is ruined, so there's the husband. And then all of these factors can end in divorce, which oftentimes uh, it can result in missed uh, administration of medication. And then lastly, uh, many of these things will end up in moving, and that can further complicate the problem. So there's lots of things that will cause families to miss these doses. Um, I'd like to spend a minute and talk with you about the importance of the missed dose because it's not always equal. Um, the, ge the geographical environment is important, um, the climate, uh, the heartworm prevalence, uh, the mosquitoes that are there in that area, the species of mosquitoes, and the numbers of mosquitoes. The time of year that missed doses occurs is obviously important, I've alluded to that already, and the number of doses missed is really important. The preventive prescribed probably plays a role here, and are they using it in a year-round manner? I want to emphasize that all these products are generally effective at preventing heartworm infection. And then the last area I'll focus on will be the response of the veterinarian to the missed dose. How do we evaluate whether it is important that we intervene, and then how might we intervene in that circumstance? So here's a, a map of the uh, heartworm uh, 
incidents in the United States from the American Harlem Society in 2013, and we'll look at two areas. We'll pick the upper Midwest, uh, which would be a low heartworm area, and we'll contrast that to the Mississippi Delta, which would be a high heartworm area. And you know, clearly there are differences there, and the differences between those two areas are there are more mosquitoes in the Mississippi Delta, there's a longer season, so those mosquitoes are going to have longer time to feed on dogs and to carry heartworms, they'll have longer time for heartworms to develop in the mosquito to the infective stage. There's a higher percentage of mosquitoes that are heartworm infected in that area, and dogs tend to spend more time outdoors. Also, they're used in activities such as hunting, and those are dogs which are more apt to get heartworms. So there are a number of reasons that that area, if you have a, a lapse in that area, it's going to be a bigger problem for you. Um, the other thing is that the number of dogs around and the area will determine whether or not the risk of heartworms is great. So this is a group of dogs in a neighborhood or in a kennel, and what we have is a uh, probably a mosquito population. Uh, Tanya Mackey did studies um, in Jonesboro, Arkansas, in which she went out into neighborhoods and captured mosquitoes and uh, pulled their little heads off and looked for infective larvae. And what she found was about seven and and a half percent of these mosquitoes were infected. But if there's one dog in a neighborhood, and that's a dog there, it used to be, um, that dog will increase the chances of mosquitoes in the area by about tenfold. So in her study in Jonesboro, the number of mosquitoes went from 7.4 to 74% if there was one dog in the kennel or in the neighborhood. So it's not rocket science, it's not out of anyone's common sense, but the degree with which it changes is quite remarkable. A tenfold increase in the risk that when a mosquito bites you, it's going to be carrying heartworms. Um, the way that I would show you how this affects us, I think, is shown for you here. Uh, you see the star in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live. It's clearly a heartworm endemic area, but it's not as much as South Carolina right below it. You can see in red, or the Mississippi Delta. But if you look at a dog, and we'll make this an indoor dog in Raleigh, um, this dog may go outside three times a day. It may or may not touch the ground, and the ground, if it does touch, is well manicured, and there are not a lot of mosquitoes. His chances of being exposed are not very great. Uh, and it's, I don't know the number, but I'd be willing to bet you um, Dr. Miller's last dollar, that it's less than 7.5%. Okay, it's, it's much lower than in the Deep South. So that dog is not at great risk because of its habitation, because of its area. But if we move that dog outside, we'll change things. And so we'll make him an outdoor dog. And what we'll actually do is we'll move him to the Mississippi Delta, and we will make him uh, a Labrador Retriever. Now, the reason for that is is because people in the Mississippi Delta oftentimes complain that the Labrador is, is the breed that is most often affected uh, by what uh, are considered to be resistant strains. And probably it has to do with the fact that those dogs stay outside. I picked this picture off the web to show you a dog outside at night, and they probably stay outside all night. In fact, I know they, they largely do. So what you have there then is a lot of mosquitoes and you have a lot of heartworms. That means then that the mosquitoes that are there are going to be packing a lot of heartworms. So lots of them and maybe 75% infection. So compared to the little dog in Raleigh I showed you, there you have room for error. Non-compliance isn't great, but oftentimes you're going to get away with it. In fact, in that particular dog, most of the time, I believe. But this dog, or these dogs, are seeing unforgiving heartworm pressure, and a very small mistake on the owner's part, or the veterinarian's part, can result in a heartworm infection. So looking at the, um, the um, table from, or the figure from um, the, the studies that were done in which dogs were infected with heartworms, known numbers of heartworms, and they were injected into a known place, and these dogs were followed along and then meticulously uh, dissected by Catonian powers to find out when exactly the molts occurred, 
um, and where the larvae were and how many they were. And so if you look at the beginning there where it says L3 to L4, infection occurs at that point. I think we'll have a mosquito come in there, yeah. So there's where the infection was. In this particular case, this was an artificial infection. And you see that very early, uh, the numbers of L3s, which are 100% right there when the mosquito feeds, will fall off. And in the first week, they're basically gone. And you can see the rise of the L4 larvae. L4 larvae are maintained for a period of time and then they molt um, and that occurs uh, at uh, say 50 to 70 days and most of them are done by 70 days. So you see the fall off of the L4s and the rise of the immature adult heartworms. At some point in time you have adults arriving in the heart and when you have adult heartworms of the opposite sex and they're consenting, they will reproduce and you get microfilaria. So that's the life cycle with, a, I think, a novel way of timing. Now, what I want to do is talk with you about how macrocyclic lactones are involved in this. And what I want to show you is that the place that these drugs are most effective is when these larvae are at the L3 and L4 stage. That's where they were first shown to be effective. That's where the studies came from. That's where they worked the best. Um, but unlike what I used to teach, uh, they are effective, it turns out, at every stage. They will kill L4s that are molting into immature adults. They will kill immature adults. And the mature adult, if you give them long enough, uh, we know this from our soft kill information from Dr. McCall, uh, that we will kill even mature adult heartworms. But what we need to emphasize here, oh, and we also will kill microfilaria. What I want to emphasize to you, though, is that is the spot. That's the sweet spot, and that's the spot you don't want to miss. And you want your clients to understand that. And from that point down, the heartworm susceptibility falls. And it turns out it's not just with the macrocyclic lactones. So any day that you go beyond that period of time, you are risking heartworm infection. You're risking failure of your products. So these drugs, oh, and I should say that as we reach the microfilaria stage, actually the susceptibility rises. So that fall is, uh, as they mature, when you then have the baby ones around, they become um, susceptible again. But keep in mind that, um, that once we have microfilaria, the dog already is infected with heartworm, so we've, we've missed our boat. So while it's useful, it doesn't uh, affect the discussion that we're having right now. So, the point then is, is that if these drugs are quite effective if you give them at 30-day intervals, and we know that you can probably get away with longer than that, but once you go beyond that 30 days, you're opening the window. And if you're in a heavily endemic area, you're increasing the chances of infection. And if you get out, you're out two weeks. Beyond that, you know, some areas you're okay, but now you're not. If you're in the Delta, I think you're not. And if you get out here at 70 days, you know, you're very likely to get the blue dot, which means you now have failed that client or that client has failed you, however the case may be. So what can we do about it? And I'm going to approach this two ways. One is, how can we prevent the missed dose? And what can we do if we have a missed dose for damage control? So prevention of the missed doses, one is educate, educate, educate. I think these owners need to understand that there's a window in time that these drugs can be given and be terribly effective. And once we get further outside that window, we start to lose our purchase on this problem. And then I think you may find, or you, you probably know this, but different families are going to do better with different preventives. We have an incredible number, variety, uh, methods of administration of these products, and one is right for each family. They probably all are not. So we'll come back to that. Damage control after there's a missed dose or doses, I think is more interesting. So first of all, I think if we can ascertain when the last dose was given, that's useful to us. And if this was greater than seven months ago, we should probably check that dog at, on this visit to see if it's infected with heartworms. If it's less than seven months, then we need to figure out when we want to test this dog. We want to test it probably seven months after it went off its preventative or 
seven months from that date, depending on what you and the client decide to do. And then we're going to take some appropriate measures, which I'll, I'll talk to you about next. Um, but we want to be sure at that point in time, they're now getting back on preventive. And this needs to be 12 months. It should always be 12 months. It should always be all year round. But particularly, if there's been a lapse, it needs to be given every month or every six months for the next 12. And then we may make one, want to make adjustments to the treatment protocol. So we don't want to forget about our friend Wolbachia. And uh, here you see a cross-section of a heartworm with Wolbachia organisms in the uterus of the, um, of the adult female heartworm. And on the right, you see them in the lateral cords, the two places that they stay. And of course, these are necessary for heartworm health, heartworm propagation. Um, and uh, we can use drugs such as doxycycline or minocycline to diminish the number of uh, of uh, Wolbachia organisms to help us in our treatment of heartworms. And one of the studies that I think is particularly interesting looked at um, doxycycline as a monotherapy. And um, this, I believe, was a study by uh, Dr. McCall again. Um, and I'm going to show it to you on the backdrop of this uh, graph from Catani and Powers. But the hypothesis was is that doxycycline alone may be able to kill developing larvae. And I think this is, is quite interesting. So the control group got nothing. They were infected with 50 L3, you see at time zero. And the control dogs who got nothing all developed heartworms and all were microfilaremic. But if they gave 30 do days of doxycycline at 10 milligrams per kilogram twice a day, the recommendation of the American Heartworm Society, they found that none of these dogs got heartworms. So one way to prevent heartworms is to give doxycycline every day. Now, I don't know that that's the most practical way, but the point is, is you do kill these developing larvae uh, by killing their Wolbachia. Well, what about the second 30 days? And that, uh, they looked at days 40 through 69 and found that it was almost a good. It dropped to 98% efficacy. So 98% of these uh, 50 L3 did not reach adulthood. It's a little less, it, might be, it may be the same, we don't know, until we look at days 65 through 94. So now, when these developing larvae are out at the uh, immature adult stage, we see that they're much less susceptible, and we kill only half of them with 30 days of doxycycline. So what we see here, again, is a fall in susceptibility as these parasites age from the larval stage towards adulthood and into adulthood. Well, I just want to point out to you that ivermectin and doxycycline are synergistic, and we now know also that imidacloprid and moxidectin is, um, is also synergistic with doxycycline. And so this study was really valuable to teach us about doxycycline, but it may not be maximizing doxycycline's effect. Second thing I want to do is bring, again, back to work that uh, John McCall did um, back in the 90s. And um, we don't talk much about reach back any longer. But what, what, what John showed was that if you use heartworm preventatives for 12 months, you could extend the window in which their efficacy is exerted, meaning that, uh, shown you in this first, um, first uh, bar graph there, um, there, the tall bar is the control group. Uh, they were infected with uh, adult heartworms, transjugular transplantation, and they are 100%. If you waited then three months in the treatment groups and gave them 12 months worth of either milbamycin or ivermectin at the preventive dosage, even with a three months lapse in therapy, you had 97 and 98% efficacy. Now, we don't talk about that very much because we don't really want people to think that they can get away with this. This is in laboratory circumstances, and this was before we had any suspicion about resistance. He then took these out to four months and did the same experiment. And what he showed was is that um, ivermectin was still effective, 95% effective, not not perfect, 5% of these dogs uh, still had adult heartworms, and milbamycin was effective, but it had lost about half of its ability uh, to prevent infections when you open that window to four months. So this is useful information, nevertheless. I want to emphasize that these dogs were treated for 12 consecutive months, and that has to be taken into consideration here. 
And I'll also emphasize that I don't believe that this is something that we should be relying upon, but knowing that we have this benefit, I think can help us with our decisions. So this has also now been shown to be true for moxidectin and salamectin, although they haven't been studied to the same degree, so they do have reach back. So all of the products on the market have some degree of reach back uh, between three and four months. And I just want to emphasize that these studies were done with non-resistant strains. So I have a hypothesis when I read this this study was that you know maybe we could use this to our benefit when we had lapses in preventive. And uh, so in, in this hypothetical, what I'm going to do is have uh, where that P is for preventive and that red arrow on your left, the, that would be the last dosage that we've given. And your owner now has some sort of event in their life and they stop giving it. And so when you see them back three months from now, well, what do you do? You would, of course, start them back on preventive and you would make sure they gave it the next month and you would hopefully be sure that they give it monthly uh, or every six monthly um, forever. That would be what you would do as a good practitioner and I'm sure everybody who stayed here until 8.30 at night is a good practitioner. So what about doxycycline? We know that it has some benefits at killing developing larvae. Could it help us close this window? So what do we know? If we gave doxycycline for 30 days here, we know from the studies uh, from McCall and Associates that we get 100%. But we're already getting 100% from our uh, macrocyclic lactone that we've chosen to use. So that doesn't help us. So there's 150 bucks that didn't help us much there. But what about the month prior to that? Well, we know from that study that you get 98% efficacy there. But again, you can assume, since these drugs work backward in time, that you're going to have somewhere around 100% efficacy there, so it didn't help you. But in the third month going backwards, you, in theory at least, have little or no effect from your macrocyclic lactone, and you're still killing half of those developing larvae. And the month before that, we don't know. The study hasn't been done. So it may drop to zero there, but it also may drop to 25 or 10%. I think it's quite conceivable that there's some benefit at that time. So I think doxycycline would be useful in this particular instance for this particular purpose. Remember, we also have reach back. So if you give the macrocyclic lactone for the next 12 months, you're going to buy yourself a little bit more benefit in that period of time in which you don't have 100% efficacy, which may also bring you up to close that window. Let's look at a couple things that are novel, maybe, maybe better. One is, remember, we can try to prevent this from happening. And I said we can educate people but we know that falls short. We can continue to try, but we don't always get these people to do what we think that they should. Um, we do know, though, that we can look at the history, and if we have people who have missed in the past, have lapses in their therapy, that we may want to take special uh, precautions with them, and that would be a place, I think, for injectable moxidectin. So if you happen to be lucky enough to have given that as your last treatment for this dog, then you're going to have covered that whole time, and this lapse is not really a lapse. If that is an owner that you know is going to have a lapse and you've chosen to treat them with injectable moxidectin, then you will preemptively have closed that window that you suspect that they indeed might uh, have. Um, the second thing I want to show you is some data about moxidectin and metacloprid uh, applied topically. That, that um, formulation of moxidectin, as you know, gives very high um, blood and tissue levels and they stay high for a prolonged period of time. So if that dog has been on that product for uh, five months and is at steady state, then it will actually reach forward for a month. So you get 100% efficacy for the month after the owner quit giving it, um, which would, be, would close that month there uh, for, the, for the, the, the most vulnerable month of those three months. Uh, as that lapse gets longer and longer, uh, clearly we have a harder time with it. So those would be a couple of ways in which you might, for that problem client, pick a product that works better for people who are not going to give it consistently. Um, what about if the barn door has already opened and that client has missed the three doses? Is there anything we can do to rescue them beyond that? And I would suggest that there is. One is we know, and I've already told you actually, uh, that ivermectin and doxycycline uh, work synergistically. Uh, 
So in the example I gave you, it was doxycycline as a monotherapy, but if we add ivermectin on board, if that's the preventive we choose to use, then we're going to get a synergistic effect, and probably we're going to enhance that 98 and 48%, hopefully, to a little bit higher, and maybe the one that we don't know, we're going to bring it up just a little bit to get more efficacy. In addition to that, um, we know that um, moxidectin and imidacloprid um, is... Uh, has some interesting aspects when it's used with doxycycline. And in a study that was done on experimentally infected dogs, uh, which um, were given moxidectin and imidacloprid plus doxycycline for 30 days, and these dogs were treated for over a year. So again, that idea that if you're rescuing them, you've got to have these people buy in, that we can close, the, we can close off the, the, the mistake if we're, if we're really diligent now. But remarkably, in that case, uh, there was uh, 150 days uh, of ability to reach backward in time, so it would completely close that window. So there is a, a particular use for that product. So my summary points um, are as follows. Uh, stuff happens. Good people have misses. Uh, we shouldn't judge them. We should hopefully get them to work with us to correct the problem. Uh, secondly, um, the time of the year clearly is part of this. And so if you have someone that misses in December, almost no matter where you are, if they start back up and give it for a year, you don't have anything to worry about. If they happen to live in Montana and that happens, it's even better. You know, the risk is much less. But if you're in the Mississippi Delta and they miss in July, you really do have a big problem and you're going to have to respond to it. Um, also, uh, prevention. You know, suspenders and a belt. We can teach these people um, ahead of time not to let this happen and we can choose products for families that are known at risk for missing out. And then lastly, uh, I talked to you about methods of rescuing this client uh, from uh, these lapses in therapy. Thank you very much.